Hi, I'm Dr. Chloe Carmichael, clinical psychologist, author of Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety, and of course, your host of The High Functioning Hotspot. Today's guest is Kenny Zhu, who is the author of the book, An Inconvenient Minority, The Attack on Asian American Excellence and the Fight for Meritocracy. It's a brand new book and it's doing very well. It's making a lot of press. Kenny has been on NPR, the New York Times Magazine and many other interesting places. He's a think tank scholar as well as I think a really sensitive and vulnerable writer. So his book shares a little bit about his own personal story, but it's mostly research and some information about a a court case where Kenny is actually also um, working and advocating. It's a court case you may have heard of where Asian American students are actually, I think it's called Students for Fair Admissions, Fair Admissions are suing Harvard for discriminating against Asian American people, um, you know, in the admissions process. So I know it's a really sensitive topic and I, I kind of wanted it in part because it was a sensitive topic. And I think that Kenny talks about the topic with a lot of sensitivity. So, um, you know, one of the things also in my article for Huffington Post called political polarization is a psychology problem is I talk about the fact that we do get so polarized when we don't listen and hear people that might have opinions that are different from ours. So that's another reason I wanted to invite Kenny because I surveyed my my list of listeners uh, recently and I noticed almost not surprisingly that my list is um, super left leaning, very liberal leaning in terms of politics. And so um, one of the things I suggest in the Huffington Post article is to listen. You don't have to agree, but to just listen to some people that might have some differing viewpoints from time to time. So without further ado, I want to bring you Kenny Zhu, author of An Inconvenient Minority, The Attack on Asian American Excellence and the Fight for Meritocracy. Hi, good morning, Kenny. Hi, Chloe, how are you? Hi, I'm great, thanks, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, thanks for uh, letting me do the podcast. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure I've been, um, I've really enjoyed reading your book and oh, I made a lot of notes on it and I have a lot of questions for you. So thanks again for taking the time to share on the high functioning hotspot. Um, oh yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> so just to jump right in, um, I wanted to start by asking you um, maybe to tell a little bit about your book. Obviously I've read it and I love it. And I'm going to give a little bit of an intro and description about it, but just for people that may not really understand everything about it. And especially I saw in some of your interviews that you shared, you know, some of those really compelling statistics that like, I think Asian Americans had to have scores that were four, four times or four standard. If you could just talk a little bit about the book and um, what it means so that, cause I know you can describe it better than I can. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you have this narrative, uh, in the United States right now that if you're white, you're, you can succeed, but if you're a minority, uh, you're oppressed, it's a privilege and oppression narrative, but this narrative ignores the success of Asian Americans who are, despite being a minority, undoubtedly successful in this country. They have higher educational rates, higher median incomes than white Americans, so much so that they are put into the privileged category by those who believe this narrative. They call Asian Americans white adjacent. And you have elite universities like Harvard and Princeton and Stanford that believe, that buy into this ideology. Some call it critical race ideology. Um, and they assign a privilege rank onto, onto Asian Americans. As such, they make it harder for Asian Americans to get into their schools because if Asian Americans were to get into their schools on merit alone, Harvard would have something like 43% Asians. Instead, they have roughly about 18 to 20% Asians. Um, and as a result, an Asian American has to score 440 points higher on the SAT to have the same chance of admission as a Black person. Uh, so what happens is that Asian wow, Americans I just want to pause on that because that's a yeah, very please. powerful number. The Asian American student has to score 
440 points higher than a student who, you know, is being categorized as black or who self identifies as black by Harvard. And that's on the SAT. And how many points again total is the SAT now these days? Uh, it's like 1600 now. It used to be 2400. So that's really quite amazing, right? That's like, it's like 20. Well, that, that was back on the 2400 point test. Okay. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. That's it's still so, pretty amazing, though. Yeah, I mean, that's um, I mean, I'm, math has never been my strong suit, but that's like nearly 20 percent higher just mm -hmm. to be considered on on equal footing. And um, just to jump in, and I, I do want to hear more of the things you were saying about that, but I just also want to chime in on the emotional level that you also described that in your book, which I thought was so powerful of what it's like for young Asian American students that have to just contort themselves, you know, into these, um, you know, almost like an academic Olympics situation mm -hmm. that if they want to have a chance on going, you know, to one of those types of schools, and I went to Columbia myself, so I, you mm -hmm. know, I, I know what a wonderful place they can be and how many doors they can open and, you know, why a person would want to go there. I also know sometimes, frankly, um, those schools, I think, are losing their luster a little bit because of, mm -hmm. you know, some of these types of, of dramas and other issues. Um, but you spoke, I think, very powerfully in your book from firsthand experience um, for anyone who's listening, Kenny. Um, you know, actually also identifies as Asian American as well. Is that, is that safe to say, Kenny? Yeah, I think that the, so what, what happens is it creates a competition culture uh, for Asian Americans, where Asian Americans, you know, because they're held to a higher standard, you know, rapidly, and, and you know this as a clinical psychologist, you know about the stress and anxiety subculture that consumes the minds of so many young, high achieving Americans. Well, if you're Asian American, it amps up to 150% because everybody's trying to get into these good schools. Everybody's trying to get up the rat race. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying Asian Americans disproportionately, as well as all Americans in that high achieving stratosphere, want to go to these prestigious universities. And the fact that they make it so much harder for Asian Americans just incites distrust between Asian Americans and each other. Um, Asian Americans begin, get, begin comparing themselves to the next Asian American guy in their classroom because they know they're not going to be judged with the rest of the class. They're going to be judged with that other Asian kid. That is such an interesting point. I just have to say on so many levels, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, first of all, even just alone, the simple experience of having that extreme sense of a heightened competition just against anybody of knowing, you know, that, that you have to go home and study. You don't have time for social stuff. You don't have time for recreation because, you know, as a young Asian American high school student, that if you want to go to one of the top schools, you know, the bar is going to be that much higher that, that you have to jump over. But in your book as well, you talked about Henry um, and, and mm -hmm. Henry is, you know, uh, Kenny wrote this wonderful book um, and Henry was the quote other Asian, one of the other Asian American students in the school who was, you know, achieving maybe even, you know, on this higher level and that Kenny talked about this rivalry and, you know, the way you describe it, Kenny, again, that sense of competition, intra-group mm -hmm. competition and how that can, you know, hurt the sense of social support that, you know, Asian Americans could feel, as well as this whole dynamic creating a sense of otherness and separatism that I don't think necessarily is healthy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, Henry was the guy in my book um, and I, you know, we were friends at first and we became competitors. Um, and this, by the way, is how a lot of young Asian American people feel um, because it's, it's always, are you good as the other guy named Wong or are you good as the other guy named Shu? Now, on one hand, this sort of helps them to become higher achievers, right? Because you know, you're really constantly pushing yourself and being pushed. But on the other hand, it instills a sense of unmerited inferiority, you know, where you're not, where you have no, lo you're the locus of comparison is not even with the rest of the country. You feel alienated from that. And, you know, you, you sort of retreat into this tribal politics yourself. Yeah. Now, I have to ask you also, Kenny, because I, what I, one of the yeah. things that I love about your book, 
um, and about about you is that you not only offer, you know, kind of an emotional, vulnerable person side, human side, but you're also just such an incredible scholar and you think about issues from so many angles. Um, and of, of course, you know, and, and one of the, you know, snags for some people around this is to say, okay, well, everything Kenny is saying makes sense. However, um, if we drop or decrease, you know, some of the um, latitude that is applied to black student scores in order, you know, to try to create more opportunities for black students to come to school, if we drop or decrease those, you know, then we're, we're actually hurting black students. Um, Mm. Can you talk about that side of it, Kenny? So my book is about the lasting consequences of affirmative action, right? And affirmative action, the point of affirmative action is to give people preferences that they otherwise would not merit. That, that's what affirmative action is. It's the only way you can describe it. That's why uh, if you are Black, you get, you, know, you, you get a preference in admissions that is not based on your merit. That's that's the point of affirmative action. So, uh, you know, to say that it hurts black students, all you're doing is you're returning to meritocracy. That's what getting rid of affirmative action does. What we have now is a deviation from meritocracy that un that benefits black Americans uh, in an unmerited way that I argue. Uh, and what you're doing is you're returning back to meritocracy. Uh, and I think that that's fair because meritocracy is fair. You should be treating a person solely on the base, basis of what they can offer uh, in their character rather than their race. Now, we also have research that shows that when a Black American is admitted into these elite colleges, particularly in math and law, uh, which were the two fields studied, based on affirmative action where they weren't qualified for, they tend to perform poorly in these classes. Uh, a black student who gets into a tier one law school who is only a tier two level student um, actually tends to graduate at the bottom 25% of his class. And that impacts everything from career earnings to initial starting salary to rates of depression. That was um, a very interesting point in your book, Kenny. I just want to quickly summarize that for you know listeners that didn't read that. I thought that was so interesting. One of the things that Kenny pointed out is that being in the top quartile, say, of your law school graduating class really impacts your career because the law firms are often recruiting to get the top 25th quartile of a class. And so mm -hmm. Kenny's point is that, um, you know, apparently the research in his book shows, and he does provide a lot of references, that Black students who are admitted to the tier one schools because of affirmative action, students whose, um, you know, LSATs, et cetera, would have otherwise not placed them there, but that they were selected in part, you know, because of affirmative action, that those students end up not in the top quartile of their tier one school, therefore not being recruited. And Kenny's pointing out that if they had gone to a tier two school where they could have been admitted without affirmative action, that they do tend to perform in the top 25th quartile of that class. And then they actually tend to have better career trajectories in life. Mm -hmm. You're right, right, exactly. I mean, you if you actually match the, the student with the level of school that he should go to, you know, you tend to encourage him. You, he tends to do better in that class. Mm -hmm. uh, so affirmative action doesn't help anybody. It, it just really doesn't. Um, and of course, it increases bitterness and envy and unmerited unfairness and unfair treatment to Asian Americans too. So we have to talk about that as well. Yeah, I, I would love to talk about that. Um, there is one thing I do want to sure. kind of follow up on though as well from what you just said, when you were talking about fairness and, and meritocracy. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the, you know, kind of counterpoints to what you said that I've heard often, and I'm not saying this to start a personal debate with you, but I just kind of want to sketch out some of the points and counterpoints because I know our high functioning listeners, they have active minds. And so they're thinking about some of these things. Of so when you talk about, you know, fairness and meritocracy, I think one of the common responses to that is, okay, well, how can we really talk about fairness? Like suppose we have a race and there's a starting line, but people who have had less privileged backgrounds 
they don't get to start at the actual starting line. They have to take two steps back for the you know burdens of oppression or socioeconomic status that they have carried in life. And so it's not really a quote fair, you know, race unless you take those things, you know, into account. And again, Kenny, I thought you made some amazing points about how, you know, many Asian American students um, have parents that didn't even speak English. And so that there are many, you know, burdens of privilege. But if you don't mind speaking to that side of it, I would love to just hear you articulate that. Yeah, well, first of all, it's not like Asian Americans don't come here privileged. They really don't. They actually come here with no generational wealth, no social connections. You know, the only thing they have are their talents, you know? Um, and so it is meritorious that they advance in through society because they're not, they're not coming from privilege, so to speak, largely. Um, and, 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 and second of all, I love, I love the analogy of the race that you use. So, is any race ever run? Has any actual race ever run the way that you just said? No. No, no. Every race is run where everybody starts on the same starting line and nobody really cares. Uh, or, or maybe people care for story purposes, but nobody is going to move the starting line back or forward in an actual race because one person came from one background or from another background. You have the same standard for everybody. That's, that's what we call fair. That is fair. And what, what universities do in trying to account for every nickel and nuance of oppression and privilege that a person has in his life, in their life, is that they're actually stepping out of their purpose. They're stepping out of their function. Their function is not to correct for every injustice in society. That is impossible. You cannot do that. Their function is to provide the best academic education to admit the best kids and produce the best graduates. And, and to the extent that they can do that, that's what is fair. But, but there's an elite arrogance here where, where elite universities are attempting to position themselves as the arbiter of all that is good and evil. And that is a very dangerous precedent to set. Mm -hmm. And you also had some interesting statistics in your book about, you know, that many of the Black students at some of these schools actually had a great deal of social privilege or, you know, um, of wealth around them. Does any of that come to mind that you can share? Sure. I mean, 71% of all Black students admitted to Harvard come from upper middle or upper class backgrounds, right? Um, and so these are kids that are, that 50% of them go to private schools, you know, a greater than almost 50% of them, in fact, one, some could argue greater than 50% of them are actually black immigrants. So this is, this is not even like you're admitting the, the kid from the South side of Chicago now. You're, you're admitting a kid who by all means is a very privileged person um, and, and you're treating him as an oppressed group. And that, that, is an, that is an exploitation of the system. That is something that we can't allow to happen. Yeah, that's that's so interesting, Kenny. And I feel like it takes a lot of um, courage to talk about that, you know, because I think that we all want to protect and help the vulnerable. Um, and sometimes being labeled as vulnerable and as a need of protection um, can almost in a certain way then um, become something that people want to compete for because it, it can connote certain advantages. Um, and so when you do what you're doing and start, you know, challenging those advantages and challenging affirmative action, I imagine that you've been called a bigot, a racist. I imagine you've been called a lot of things. Can you talk about how you respond to that or even just how you handle it on a personal level? Well, um, right. I mean, we're moving, first of all, your point about the encouragement of victimhood. That's definitely happening. I call it an economy of victimhood. There's a new sub-economy right now. There, normally the economy moves according to meritocracy, but now we're creating an alternative economy where people are being promoted and hired via diversity and inclusion based on the uh, biggest victim story that they could give. Um, so we're, we have, we're creating an alternative economy. Now, in terms of my personal experience, right? I could give you the most victim story of myself. Um, and a lot of it is based on the fact that I'm a minority, 
you know, my parents did not come here with any money, social privilege, that kind of thing. I, I've faced discrimination clearly, obviously, from Ivy League universities. Um, maybe I could point to one or two isolated racist incidents that I've faced in my life. Um, but that's not the narrative that I choose to give about myself because I love this country and because this country has been great to me and it's been great to a lot of people. Um, this is why this is a country that accepts a million new immigrants a year, which is the, the, the most in the entire world by a very wide margin, you know? And what we should be doing is we should be celebrating the success of minorities in this country rather than trying to denigrate them through a privilege and oppression narrative. And that's how I choose to live my life. And I think that that's a much better way of living your life than focusing on self-victimhood. Definitely. I, I would absolutely agree with you. Um, so I, I, I'm just curious then, have you also yourself been ever charged, you know, as being a racist or of, you know, ad, like Kenny is actually involved in, in, a, in the lawsuit, right. Which is against Harvard for, um, for, a, for basically discriminating against Asian people, if I'm, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I believe that's currently in it in the process of appeals and, and may be heard by the Supreme Court. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's at the foot of the Supreme Court right now. It's I'm sorry. It's at the foot of the Supreme Court right now. Yeah, taken as early as October. Wow, that's exciting. That's really exciting. Um, you know, and you know, with that though, I'm I'm just curious. You know, if, if you've ever face charges either either from the black community or you know from the elites who like to maybe think of themselves as the mouthpiece of the black community that may be charging you with some kind of a of a of a label of of being racist or hurting black people how do you respond to that so ordinary black americans that i talk to support me in fact if you go on my website or you, you go on my twitter page at kenny m shoe i have a video where I'm doing a man on the street interview, where I'm talking with actual black students at Harvard. And I asked them, do you support this policy where Asians are, are required to or have a 440 point SAT penalty? And they say, no, we don't, we don't support that. We, we don't support that policy. I get it, there's racism and oppression, but we shouldn't try to arbitrate between that. Um, and uh, that, that's, and, and so ordinary black people that I talk to usually support me on this. Elites think that I'm being racist, which is, of course, very silly because I'm fighting racism, I'm fighting Harvard's racism. Everybody really should get on board and support this kind of policy because what we really should return to as a country is a colorblind meritocracy. That is the ideal of what America has always been about. It has always been about, doesn't matter what background you have, and it doesn't matter where you come from, you, if you come here and you work hard, you can succeed in this country and you'll be treated on the basis of that work, not on the basis of your identity. Yes, I mean, but it's so it's interesting, Kenny, because as you know, it's now become controversial to say that, you know, I want to live in a colorblind society or, or I want to, you know, not see race. Um, and I think a lot of the listeners of this show um, certainly like to think of themselves as thoughtful, intelligent, sensitive people. And if they're being told, you know, that the newest research shows that advocating for a colorblind perspective is actually harmful to people of color. Um, I think that they might, you know, almost feel caught in the middle when they hear what you're saying. So can you, I, I know that you move in a lot of different circles and I, I'm just curious if you have any message for people that are hearing what you're seeing and thinking to themselves, well, what Kenny is saying makes sense, but I've also heard that this type of thinking is actually very hurtful, you know, and, and I, I should be careful of it. Well, let me, I mean, let me ask those listeners a question then. When you approach somebody in a conversation and you talk to somebody, do you want that person to assume things about you based on what, solely based on what you look like? And I think the majority of people would say no. I don't, I wouldn't want somebody to come up to me and assume that I'm oppressed because I'm Asian, or I think the majority, by the way, the majority of black Americans would not want somebody to come up to them at a party and say, wow, I feel so sorry for you. You must be so oppressed. That, that pretty much starts the conversation off on that note. When we say colorblind, what we really mean is we don't want to assume anything about a person based on race. 
And I think that that's a very fair point to make. I think that's a, that's a very fair way to view the society. And the reason why people are attacking colorblindness is because there's a huge race industry right now that profits off of dividing and categorizing people into race. You know, the head of diversity and inclusion at Berkeley makes $450,000 a year. Wow. You know, you have ethnic studies consultancies in California. By the way, ethnic studies is about to be a mandate in California that charge $1,500 an hour to teach Ooh, kids. Asian. More American. than I charge. <laughs> I know, you wish, right? I wish. Yeah. <laughs> would I sell out for that? I don't know. I wouldn't. But some people would. <laughs> yeah. So that's amazing. That's why people attack colorblindness because it threatens their industry. It threatens their narrative um, that keeps their, their, their lifestyle alive. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Um, now, I do want to return to what you mentioned earlier, and I said I do want to get to it, and I, and I do, so I'm going to get to it now, sure. which is that you talked about that there's this resentment and animosity that can actually then be increased around Asian American students, you know, because of some of these policies. Um, do, you, do you want to get back to that? Because you were saying it was an interesting conversation um, about you know, actual prejudice and bias against Asian and Asian American people. Hmm. Uh, sure. Yeah. You know, this is this. I'll tell you why Harvard does this policy to Asian Americans, why they treat Asian Americans like this. Um, they're not radicals. They're the, the university. Some people like to paint their admissions officers as a bunch of leftist radicals. They're not radicals. They're just people who are concerned about the image of their university. And when they talk to their donors and when they talk to themselves, um, they, they, they wonder whether a college of 43% Asians, that's 43% Asians, whether people would like that, you know, and they question that. Um, it's a very sort of, it's, it's, an, it's a mentality that's, that, that bakes into racial stereotyping, right? They think that if there are too many Asians at this campus, they'll just bring, they're sort of test-taking robot with no personality emotions there. And as a result, that's why they grade Asian Americans lowest on personality. Harvard grades people on three things, academics, extracurriculars, and personality. Asian Americans, highest on academics, highest on extra extracurriculars, lowest on personality. Why? It's not because they're objectively lowest, although it's really hard to measure personality, but because Asian Americans uh, actually score very high on alumni interviews, they score very high on teacher recommendations. And there's no reason for this, except that Harvard's admissions officers simply do not want too many Asians at this, uh, at this college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful, Kenny. And I wanted to also just ask you on a personal level, how you came to this. And I know you share, you know, some of it in your book, that you went through this process yourself of applying to, you know, schools and, and having all of the most, you know, amazing credentials and then suddenly finding, you know, that, that you were not getting in. Um, and then you, you went to Davidson, which is great. And then that's where you encountered um, the Young America Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, but how did you, I'm just curious what the process was like when you went to Davidson, had you heard of the idea that there was, um, you know, a, a conservative movement that was looking at these issues, or had you? It was it was it new information for you? So at the time, there wasn't even a conservative movement that was looking at these issues. Um, at the time, it was only Asian Americans really speaking up because it was such an open secret. There are a couple of isolated conservatives speaking out about this. Um, but the movement speaking out about this is only covered in the past couple of years, and it is in large part due to Students for Fair Admissions, the group sued Harvard, their activism, my activism, um, the book. And, um, and so we've been able to make, get a lot of mainstream attention on, on this news. But it's true, you know, when I was, um, it was always an open secret that the Ivy Leagues were going to discriminate against us. This was one reason why I never applied to Harvard because I was so, um, uh, I just couldn't on principle. Um, but I did apply to a few Ivy Leagues, I didn't get in. Um, and, you know, I was appropriately bitter about that. There are some people who are a lot more bitter than me. Um, but when I went to Davidson uh, and I realized that this ideology 
is spreading. It's not just in the Ivy Leagues anymore. It's in all of the gifted and talented programs that, who are trying to put anti-racist ideology into their top math and science high schools. Thomas Jefferson High School in Fairfax, Virginia, just passed a new policy, went from 73% Asian Americans in that school because of merit-based admissions to 35, 40% in one year because they could not stand the thought of too many Asians, such privileged group taking over all of the spots. Um, so all this ideology is spreading. And I realized that because this ideology is spreading, I can't stand silent anymore. I have to write a book about it. Yeah, and it's a very bold book. Do you mind sharing how your family has reacted to you writing this book? They love it. They love it. They're, they're so supportive of me and I'm really grateful, you know. Um, we, it is true that Asian Americans um, tend to choose more stable professions at times, you know, finance, consulting, that kind of thing. And I think it's totally fine. You know, um, being a doctor is great. You're doing such a great service to the country. But once in a while, if an author comes and shakes things up, I don't think it's such a bad thing. No, no, I, I think it's amazing. Um, so I'm just, I wanted to also share with you, I, I love that, you know, you even applied some of these thoughts as well, you know, to priority, to prioritizing women's admissions um, in school hmm. and in the workplace. And I just want you to know, I actually can really identify with that. And I can really understand that, you know, for myself um, as a business owner, also because my revenue is um, a million plus per year, I get certain kinds of recognition and it's always a conversation like, oh, well, and Chloe's a woman. And so for a woman in business, you know, to make this revenue or whatever, um, I always, I mean, it's, it's kind of always like such a weird thing. And, um, and now as well that I think women are actually graduating college at higher rates than men. Um, I personally would have no problem at all, you know, with schools and everywhere else just saying like, okay, we're, you know, no longer going to be specifically prioritizing women's applications. So Students for Fair Admission, uh, we'll definitely drop a link to that in the show notes, and we'll definitely drop a link, of course, to your Twitter, and of course, to your book. Um, also, perhaps, you know, if there's any, I guess, through Students for Fair Admission is where people can click to get updates on that Supreme Court case. Um, is there anything else, Kenny, that I haven't asked you about that you think people should know? Um, you should know that I'm president of Color Us United, colorusunited.org. We advocate for a race blind America. I know we talked a little bit about that. I know that term is, you know, people have different ideas about what that means, but I want to tell you guys, you know, if we have to fight, if we want to fight a, a, a truly racist ideology, which is an ideology that fixates on race. You can call it anti-racism, you can call it critical race theory, you can call it diversity and inclusion, you can call it whatever. You have to have a principle that supports what you do. And there's no better word to say it than colorblindness, because it says exactly what we need to say. We need to be a country that is, does not assume people on the basis of the color of their skin. Uh, so we're going out there at colorusunited.org. Even if you're just interested, you should take a look and then you should sign our petition. That's awesome, Kenny. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining on the High Functioning Hotspot. We'll make sure we provide links to all of those in the show notes. Thanks again. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Well, I hope that you enjoyed listening to that conversation with Kenny Zhu. There is one thing I forgot to ask him about, which is that, um, you know, he's done all kinds of talks and addressed all kinds of groups, including um, apparently the it says here in his bio, I'm reading, including the All Black Connecticut Parents Union, that he was apparently invited to speak there. And I would have actually loved to have asked Kenny, you know, what that conversation was like and how that went for him. And I'm certainly going to be curious to follow him, the Supreme Court case where Kenny is active. Um, and we did put all of those links as well um, that he mentioned into the show notes. So thank you so much for listening to the High Functioning Hotspot with me, Dr. Chloe Carmichael, and I'll see you next time.